Hi, my name is Katintul Zorik, and I beat the often path by moving from the VC space to a creative space by working on a a movie uh, as well as an associated brand with my husband as well as a business partner. Joining us right now is Kat Zorig, an investor at Innospark, and she's invested in AI and robotics companies. She's led and co-led investments in Neurable, Javelin, and Cora, and many more. And she herself has been an MIT-backed CEO and founder, all as a first-generation Mongolian immigrant. In short, Kat is one of the coolest, most inspiring people that I have ever met personally. She's actively shaping neurotech, AR, VR, and even fashion by merging her native Mongolian culture with the tech of tomorrow, creating some truly out of this world designs. She's a fashion designer, making crazy futuristic East meets West clothing, and she also envisions an optimistic future where AI will automate all of our mundane, repeatable tasks, leaving our brains and creativity to soar. So if you've ever listened to even one episode of this show by now, you'll know how excited I am about these kinds of topics and this talk. So here's Kat Zorg, I'm Ross Palmer, and this is Beat the Often Path. Welcome to the show, Kat. Now, you come here by way of a mutual connection, Ramsey's Al-Qaeda, uh, who, whom you have invested in in his company, I believe, and he speaks incredibly highly of you. And uh, I looked at your bio, and he told me your story, and it's just wild. You have a very <laughs> off-the-beaten-path tale. In more ways than one, you are a pioneer in several things that you have done, starting from the fact, I believe, that you're the first student at MIT in your program from Mongolia. Like, let's begin. Where should we jump into the uniqueness of your story? Oh, thank you. Yes, I love Ramses, and I'm so happy that you know, he was able to connect me to you. Um, yeah, so I was born and raised in Mongolia uh, during uh, and after the collapse of the Soviet Union and kind of the move from capital, you know, communism to capitalism. Um, and during that time, a lot of, you know, everyone was mostly nomadic um, and lived in the countryside. And just people are trying to survive, right, by... Uh, for the first time learning to be entrepreneurs. So my parents um, were the only kids from their families of seven siblings each that lived in the countryside to go to the city and go to college um, to study uh, construction engineering. So um, we, I had an opportunity to kind of, you know, live in the city, but also uh, live in the countryside with my, with my family. Um, my relatives, I should say. So that kind of like took me on an interesting journey of um, being able to learn English, um, watching my dad, you know, try to do a business and really struggling, um, but also doing well at the same time, better than my relatives uh, in the countryside. Um, and then, uh, you know, took me to the to the U.S. on an exchange program um, to, uh, uh, in the last year of high school, basically. So I came to Montana to study, uh, you know, live with, with the host family for a year and study English, um, and, uh, really kind of like learn what the Western life is like for the first time. And unfortunately wow. during that year, my dad passed away in, in Mongolia, um, which kind of led the family to, you know, figure out what to do. Uh, we came to the decision that my, my mom and my brother should really come to the U.S. so that we can continue our education in the U.S. Um, so they came after my program and we kind of lived as, you know, immigrants for um, many years, working at restaurants um, full time, going to community college full time and, and you know, just trying to make ends, ends meet. Sure. Um so from there, fast forward, I was, I had the opportunity to kind of like continue my education, study math at University of Virginia. Uh, from there, uh, did studied math, which was one of the only kind of things that I was good at. The other one was art, um, but I didn't choose because I wanted to make money. <laughs> I wanted to survive <laughs> in, in America, oh, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> So I, I went with that math path. I went to Accenture to work at consult, you know, as, as a consultant, uh, building analytics and uh, big data solutions for big government and big organizations. Um, got a little bit bored with that. I wanted to, you know, explore emerging technologies like AI and and also kind of work with more uh, uh, towards the 
you know, earlier stage innovation side of things. So, and the last thing was I wanted to do something for Mongolia eventually. So how do I get to that point? At that mind, you know, at that time, my mind said, I have to go back there with money and power. <laughs> this uh, is like, this is what, you know, survival. Yeah, I've seen that movie. It's called Scarface. Yeah, exactly. Great to... <laughs> exactly. Let's just hope it doesn't end with you gunning down people over a mountain of cocaine. <laughs> let's let's skip oh, that part. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. So I said, okay, in order to have money and power, I have to be become a CEO. In order to become a okay. CEO, I have to get an MBA. So that led me to uh, MIT um, to uh, to get my MBA. And at that time, I or, or later I learned that I was one of the uh, there were other Mongolians in at MIT doing computer science and and other programs, but um, at the MBA program, I was the one of the, the first people there from Mongolia. Um, so when I was at MIT, I really kind of explored, you know, AI, AR, and VR. Really, kind of like threw myself into the entrepreneurial space. Um, uh, and a friend of mine at that time, I, I mean, you know, my. Application, I should say, MBA essay. Set, um, my MBA essay basically said, "I will become a CEO in Mongolia one day, but and help build the tech ecosystem there. But I need to, you know, get kind of like build my strategic skills first at the big four consulting firms, right?" But a friend of mine who is very wise <laughs> told me, if you want to start a company, you should just do it now. There's no, you don't need enough, you know, you already have what you need. You don't need more consulting experience. You don't need more strategic, you know, thinking skills. You're going to learn that on the job. So that, thankfully, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Joseph, a classmate at, at Sloan, um, told me that, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and so I, and at the time also, I was having my first kind of uh, depressive episode. Um, and I realized um, that, you know, people in Mongolia were really experiencing it. And everywhere in, you know, just in the US too, uh, especially underprivileged communities just don't have access to mental health care. And this is something that I really wanted to work on. So I picked um, mental health as an area that I wanted to solve with AI uh, and uh, worked on a, a company called uh, Buddy that was going to be a chatbot for mental health. So this was in 2017. So okay. mental health so we're is- ahead of the curve. Yeah, At mental least health- a few years anyways. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> At least a couple of years. Yes, exactly. Yeah, mental health was still very stigmatized. Now it's like not at all, right? It's increasingly non-stigmatized. Chatbot technology itself wasn't there at all, but I only found out after, I, by doing it, after I started the company and, and really trying to do something about it, I learned that the tech was not quite there yet. Um, and then the last thing was um, um, I did have a co-founder from... Uh, MIT and Harvard Health Science Technology Program who was doing computer science, I'm sorry, uh, who was doing PhD in computational neuroscience. So um, together as co-founders, um, we just wanted to solve mental fitness um, that does both at, like passive monitoring from your, your phone and then based on some, you know, uh, uh, early kind of warnings, the chatbot itself actively kind of walks you through improving or whatever it might be um, to help with mental health. So anyway, so we went through, you know, all the resources at MIT. Um, we got into the Delta V Accelerator, which is the capstone accelerator program at MIT. I saw that. Very cool. Yeah. And got um, a lot of funding um, from... MIT in general to kind of like keep this idea going for about a year and a half. Um, and when we learned about the tech, uh, just not being quite there yet, we decided to put it on hold and said, you know, maybe I'll get a little bit more funding experience. So no, not, not, not funding, sorry. Um, put it on hold and decided to just get a little bit more experience in either product development or anything that would help me kind of get back into this uh, later. 
Um, so then I came across a really interesting opportunity where uh, a classmate of mine um, had just started working at a fund that was being built um, called InnoSpark Ventures. Um, it uh, was was going to be a hundred million fund focusing on early stage um, AI and impact focused uh, companies, um, specifically in the Boston area. And it was just one of those things where I was already kind of doing that and they were going to be investing in those companies, you know, kind of felt like a meant to be type of opportunity and, and partnership. So I joined them um, kind of at the ground level and helped the founders uh, build the fund and make up to around, I think, 30 some investments by the time I left last year. Yeah. Um, so, but when I was there, I was just so still very much passionate, you know, about uh, neurotech and the brain and mental health that all I wanted to invest in were companies like Neurable um, right. that was using AI to help uh, people with with the brain, basically. So, um, let's see. So, uh, what was the original story? What was the, the, the <laughs> yeah, question well, again? I'm yeah, like, I mean, well, where do we dive in? The, 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 yeah. the original question is, where do we dive in? Because you've had such an impressive, <laughs> it's, it's such a bizarre story. Um, okay, let me ask this question. First of all, is Boston special? Because I know we've been very Boston heavy. As of the time of this airing, we'll have featured many Boston entrepreneur stories. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that Boston really is a special area for startups? And is it due to the fact that there are so many schools there like MIT and Harvard and all of these other is it a unique place or do you think that there are many such pockets of advancement or tech or whatever you want to call it throughout the United States and the world? Um, obviously, there are many such places, but I do really think that uh, Boston is such a special place just because of the, the types of people that it attracts Sure. Um, because of the schools that's here, right? I mean, as you know, we become the average of the five people that we surround ourselves with. If I hadn't, you know, had the opportunity. Don't remind me. <laughs> if I, if I'm I, on a downward slide, let no, me tell you're you. Not. Oh, I'm going straight down. <laughs> Look at you. You're doing great. <laughs> That's right. I got this shirt. I got a background. I got a camera from somebody. <laughs> no, things are going well. Uh, but no, you're, you're right. That was a feel. I asked that because I had that feeling, and I was only there for a few days. But it almost had, I want to say, a mythical feeling because let's not overdo it. But there was a palpable energy to the city of Boston, and there were a type of people. It just kind of felt like connections were possible there. Yes. Like you might just walk the street and meet somebody, and that person might have a material change on your life. And that is in many ways the opposite of what it's like out here in Southern California, where everybody is so spaced apart physically. Mm. It's a car town. Here we have the syndrome of there are lots of interesting people that I know, but you never see each other because you have to make plans. And then you say, hey, let's get together sometime. Mm. And then four years pass. And then you realize, oh, I haven't <laughs> talked to that person in four years. That's the LA way. That's the California way. Mm. But in Boston, it feels like with the Boston Commons and all these areas that people can just go to, it felt more communal to me, and it also felt like there were a lot of intelligent people wandering around trying That's to true. solve problems. And there was maybe not so much ego as some other places I've seen. Does that feel right, or am I just ignorant? I, I think so, um, especially with MIT, with MIT. You know, I really felt home there because everyone is extremely down-to-earth, nerdy, quirky, people. So I felt like I could be myself. Um, but they're also super smart. Uh, and they're all, you know, worried about, um, solving a, a problem in the world and, and making an impact, which That's I, what it seemed like I was very me. inspired by. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's ultimately, you know, especially in the venture capital world now, in, you know, I'm finding out in the movie industry, um, and just the entrepreneurial space, network is one of the biggest, the most important things, right? So, but it's not about like networking. It's about finding people that 
care about the same problems exactly yes exactly that that are wonderful and that care about the same that are passionate about the same problems that you want to solve and you can just kind of nerd out together and i think maybe boston has the has but my my view is biased obviously because i've been in boston for a while now but you know uh, you have a higher chance of meeting folks like that here um, because of the schools and the proximity of the schools together yeah uh, and and speaking of that, I noticed from your website, which I don't know how old this is, but you, you said something like you're pat, you're trying or you're pursuing being the change you wish to see in the world. That famous quote from Gandhi, quote which I think about often. Another quote that I think about a lot is uh, "Be as you wish to seem." I'm a big mm-hmm. fan of classic philosophy, Plato, Socrates, Epictetus, you name it. Mm-hmm. And I think you and I both have the same mission along those lines of trying to figure out what it is that we're trying to achieve in this world and how we can best achieve it and the kind of impact. And I'd like to take a moment before we switch gears here to just say the fact that you were able to build a life in this space and the kind of life that you did coming from such humble beginnings, that is the American dream. There can be no doubt about it. I mean, you, through your own merit and talent alone, not only ended up going to some of the finest schools in the country and the world, but you got plugged in to a scene that is not easy for anybody to plug themselves into, and you did it all yourself. So that's pretty ridiculous. Do you feel proud about that, or is it just, eh, whatever, another day? (laughs) Who cares? (laughs) Um, Obviously, I am proud of myself for, um, for doing the work. It, it was, it has been really hard work. And I would say also luck, a lot of luck, you know, a lot of times I felt like I happened to be at the right time at the right place and maybe with the right attitude, <laughs> you know, um, and be able to kind of like roll up my sleeves, willing to roll up my sleeves and, and do whatever it takes. Um, but I wouldn't say it's like, it's all me. It's, it's because of, uh, the friends that I've made, my family, you know, my mom and my brother who are here and supporting me and, and believes in me wholeheartedly, um, that I am going to do something wonderful and, and amazing in this lifetime. You know, that, that belief alone gives me enough energy to just kind of throw myself into anything <laughs> without really, there's fear that comes obviously, but without really, I guess, questioning it, if that makes sense. Um, it does, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's truly uh, remarkable. Would you say that your talent? You said you had an early knack for mathematics. What do you think your greatest skill is at this point? You said art, art, mathematics. What do you feel your biggest strength is? Um, maybe my smile. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's that book, The Magic of Thinking Big, and <laughs> there's a whole chapter on that. So you might be right. Smile yeah. big and yeah. results are guaranteed. But only really? if you smile it, big. Yeah, it it's, a, it's a, one a of those impact. old uh it's one of those old self-help business books, one of the first ones that I read many years ago. But it said if you smile big, results are guaranteed. If you don't smile big, we can't guarantee the results. Smile <laughs> more. Uh that it's that kind of tone, one of those like entry to business books. It's a good book. Yeah. I can recommend it, but not a lot of information in there. Other uh, than that, that one. Uh, other than that one thing one that chapter. I still remember, yeah, <laughs> which is huge. Um, I mean, that could that yeah. could change lives. It's true, and the, and I say this all the time on the show, but how to win friends and influence people. Another book that I highly oh, I recommend. love that book too. Dealing with people, that's one of the keys. Getting better at dealing with people, whether they work for you or whether you work for them. Um. I felt like that last question was almost like a job interview. So now I feel like I have to ask you what your desired salary is and when can you start? Um, but in, in seriousness, uh, so yeah, you, you, you've gotten into this. What is something that you learned about the world of venture capital being on that side? Did you have an, did you have a say in the companies that you as a fund were able to invest in? You said you're interested in neurotech and AI. Um, do you feel that these funds are valuable tools for furthering the kind of change that you might want to see in the world? Um, 100%. I mean, capital alone is such a big impact, right, that that you're making uh, on these companies. Um, now, on top of that, the the value that you add, I would say, comes in a couple of folds. One is obviously the network. The network is Again, you know, as we were talking about earlier, um, access to other investors, 
more money, <laughs> access to other founders, successful CEOs, and more folks, you know, that has the experience and, and skills to really help uh, the companies. Um, but they're bringing really kind of, you know, um, thing, how, how can I say this? Like what they're bringing is what has worked for them, right? In the past. Yes. And whether yes. that's how many years ago, doesn't matter. Um, obviously, when you think about human beings, there are certain things that kind of history repeats itself. So you can take certain patterns from that and apply it in the future, but it only goes so far, right? Uh, so in my mind, uh, the area that that VCs struggle to help with are kind of like thinking beyond that. And that comes from the founders themselves and their kind of own stories and own um, problems that they're trying to solve and own way of looking at the world is is how I how I've kind of come come to because uh, it's like Facebook on. was successful, so we need to find the next Facebook. They can only think in terms of the model of what has worked in the past, mm -hmm. but that was a moment in time. It's also survivorship bias. So it's exactly. hard to think truly originally. Would that be accurate? I hundred percent. And yeah. it's if you look at AI, it's kind of the same thing, right? I think everybody's uh, an AI company now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't. I don't know what it means, but everybody's doing it. <laughs> but if you also just think about, you know, AI as a technology, I and mean, everyone is kind of scared about it, but ultimately, there's um, what it is doing is it's just finding from the data the patterns that worked in the past, but. What we say in the AI world is uh, there is a long tail problem, which is in real life, right? There's uh, there are things that just can't be predicted. Um, real life is chaotic. Uh, all right. Well, you have, you're optimistic about AI, so this is a good segue here. You're optimistic, yes. and you've said that you believe that 100%. AI can just replace some of the mundane tasks that we don't like to do. So I, I assume that maybe you're thinking of a future with a universal basic income. I'm not sure. You, I think you said somewhere that you want to free us up for more high-level tasks and let yes. AI take it over. Uh, what is the basis for your optimism in AI, and why are you not as afraid as some people are who maybe don't understand it as well? I think um, the AI is is going to be only as good, not I should good or when I say the word good, I'm I'm talking about like kind ethical of like good, good or bad. Yes, or? yes, as good as the the data which is being generated by the people, right? Sure. Um, as I see more and more people healing and uh, mental health becoming more destigmatized. Um, and if you talk to, I feel like more and more people are just working on themselves. They're connecting with their higher selves, you know, especially with COVID, they had a lot of time with themselves to think deeply about. A lot of bread bakers. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exploring their creative side. As people go through this, more and more, I think more and more people will heal from their traumas and, and baggages, which will create data that um, will feed the AI. Is, is, that's how I think about it. And, and I am an optimist in general. So that's, you know, I'm, I, I think people will heal because they don't want to feel like that. No one wants to feel, you know, negative and Yeah, no one wants to feel that they want. They're all searching for for a solution for their healing. Um, so that's how I. That's how I. Like we have the symbiotic relationship with the AI that we're building. Uh, no matter which specific use cases, they're all kind of separate, but ultimately they're all going to connect to one singularity that will be built by people who are healed. Is what I'm hoping. That's what you're, what an interesting take. That's a nuance that I have not heard anybody say. So you mm. think that we ourselves are healing and that in parallel, that's going to create, first of all, do you think that the singularity will occur when AI becomes sentient and conscious? And do you think, do you have a time frame when you think that might occur? I mean, it, it, it will occur in the future. I, I think it will definitely occur in the future, but it's so far away. <laughs> okay. Farther like than decades, we think. Farther than we think. Okay. Yes. Some people said like 50 years 
40, uh, t- 10, 20 years ago, but now you no. think it's going I back. Mean, they, they said that in the 80s, right? When like AI was not yeah. called AI. And I mean, there's certain things around, um, for example, common sense is what comes from us, right? And that's, yeah. that's something that is really hard to codify and incorporate into the AI. Um, uh, and it's also something that only 50% of the people in this country have, so... Uh, <laughs> Oh, 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 oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> getting off the road. Re- we'll come back. Business podcast. Business <laughs> podcast. Rain it in, buddy. Rain yeah. it in. Um, but yeah, no, okay. So I mean, yeah. both sides have their own version of common sense, That's right? True. And that, that is common true. sense yes. is constantly changing. There's there are, there are two. Yes, I agree. yeah. So I think like my common sense is going to be different from your common sense, and that's why this is really hard to like incorporate into it like what is it you know what i mean what does it yes mean to have a common sense we don't know yeah. really it's constantly changing yeah and, and i think these as these strikes well it, it's always a question of when the in-group changes and when the majority changes that's something that i find is always an inflection point in society you know when when people identify with one group but then another group takes over. And, and that's the way I feel about, and I'm sure you must feel the same way because you want to uplift uh, immigrants or, or you know ethnic minorities in this country and founders, and that's something you want to support. When the minority becomes the majority, which is the case of the demographics in the United States, and when the unemployed outnumber the employed, when all of when the ratios change, mm. then things change. Like SAG, after all of the AI discussion now, it's because the majority of actors, the majority of writers are not able to survive in this system. And when that ripples out and the minority becomes the majority, then suddenly our perception changes. You know, when when the majority has a stable job and they're happy, then the status quo sounds pretty good. But when Mm. nobody has a stable job and a lot of people have been replaced by AI or automation, Mm. that's when I think change has to happen because people have to eat. I agree. Yeah. So we'll get there. Um, all right. So VC, coming back. <laughs> cool. Uh, it's coming back to VC. You left that world a year ago. I want to get to the new part. Uh, you mm-hmm. left that world. What made you decide to leave? Obviously, you've progressed through various thinking. You, you, your own thought has changed as you have morphed and gone through your career. How did you make that decision? And why did you make that decision to switch and to do what you're doing now? Yeah. So it actually started kind of serendipi- serendipitously. Um, I was, uh, I had, I had like a little biking accident and had a concussion. So I couldn't work, uh, for like three months, which was a silver lining. <laughs> okay. Um, during that work somehow, um, just weird timing. This is how the universe works, right? My husband, whose name is Kyle Delacuilla, who is now my partner on this, um, uh, on our new venture. Um, he, he is uh, a co-founder of a, a company called Rise Robotics that's building kind of these um, electromechanical hydraulics uh, so that they can um, electrify heavy machinery. Uh, uh, hydraulics are like one of the only things that's forcing heavy machinery to keep with diesel. So they're their tech would enable uh, move away okay. from diesel for heavy machinery. Anyway, so one of uh, so his co-founders are like MIT grads, and um, one of their early investors is this guy named Bill Warner, who's an MIT alum back in the seventies. Um, he also was the guy that created the first digital video editor that the movie industry adopted, you know, widely, and it currently uses. So, like he his tech changed the movie industry. Before his tech, it was, you know, the film and cut and put into a movie. He did the digital. Was that Avid or what? what yes, software was Avid. That? Okay, wow. So he was the creator and founder of okay. Avid. Yeah. Um, he also did a bunch of other stuff and his tech is in, in like, in, he's the inventor hall at the Smithsonian or something like that. But like a I really wonderful it. guy. Yeah, a really wonderful person. Amazing. Okay. Um, anyway, so he's uh, one of the angel investors at Kyle's company, Rise Robotics. Um, and apparently he's work, he was working on this new venture called Lightcraft Technologies that um, was going to uh, make the green screen technology much easier so that, and cheaper so that people like us can make movies. Um, so anyway, so he came to Kyle and basically was showing things around one day and said, hey, you know, in order to kind of like build this tech, we need people who can do 
digital assets, so 3D assets, and Kyle happened to be one of them. Um, he's just expert at Blender and has been playing with it for all of his life. Um, okay. Oh, quick Much background respect. on Kyle. So Kyle yeah. actually is one of the most creative people I know. Um, he went to RISD. He grew up in uh, Silicon Valley, so Santa, Santa Clara, California. And, uh, but his mom is Taiwanese and his dad is American, but half Nicaraguan and half Italian. So, and the dad is engineer, mom is an artist. So he's like, his brain just works really weirdly. Yeah, that's a, that's a powerful cocktail right there. Yeah. And then, so he, you know, kind of, he, from young age, just loved drawing and, but also is obsessed with like electrical things. So he went to RISD to do industrial design and then since then kind of been working at RISE. Um, but he's one of the most creative people I know. Uh, anyway, so as soon as this tool was Kyle in Kyle's hands, early version of it, Kyle was like, I have so many ideas of what I can do with this. Um, and the first thing was, was really simple. Bill asked Kyle to create a train. Okay. They wanted to do like a demo video, just a simple train and we're, we'll do like a, a train chase. And I'm just, you know, at this point, I'm not working. I'm just like watching what's happening. Um, and then Kyle gets his buddy, Jeff uh, Lewinsky involved, who was a classmate of his that studied film at RISD. And they started kind of like creating this train. But what they created was not, obviously not a normal train. They went, they created this crazy, huge machine that was like a, you know, like a triangle shape. It was just like insane, which shocked everyone, but also excited everyone. Um, and then it was like, okay, so now we're going to create a story around this. And I was, you know, as I'm sitting there and doing nothing, I'm like just getting back into my artist self and drawing things. And I was like, all I wanted to draw was somehow clothes. And I'm from Mongolia. So wow. as you know, like I was trying to draw yeah. things that had Mongolian sci-fi aspects. I was wondering where we were going to get in here that. because this is this is what Ramsey's told me about you first. So I was wondering, I was like, <laughs> when does that come in? I was like, I'm fascinated to figure it out. Okay, now I know. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. yeah. Drawing and then, clothes. And then yeah. we put, you know, we're like, okay, we'll, we'll make this video, short, short video that has characters. And then like, I draw, I drew uh, a character with the help of Jeff and, you know, like we're all collaborating, obviously. Um, and my mom, so this is actually the bomber jacket that I drew and my mom Ooh. like sewed this by hand cause she's really good at Looks that. Awesome. Thank you. And then, um, uh, and then we wore it and then, you know, I'm like, I decided to be in it and I decided, you know, we're shooting a bunch of stuff. Um, and then eventually it just kind of evolved into, we had no idea what we were doing, obviously, like we had no idea the bigger picture of what this all meant. But I think Kyle and I really figured out a common thing that we wanted to explore as our movie um, for, for this project. So the common theme was this idea of power um, slash energy. Uh, he had been, we both want to empower people. But he had been wanting to empower people through the idea of electricity, right? Electricity is power and energy. So it's more physical. And then I had been wanting to empower people through more metaphysical. So, you know, power from within. And that's very Eastern idea. And I think that comes from where I'm from, right? Um, empowering people from within. And then, you know, Kyle wanted to empower people from the outside, so we realized this is the this is going to be the idea that we'll explore for the movie, uh, and uh, it's both East meets West, which is both of us. It's you know kind of like ancient ideas meeting kind of like future ideas, which is also really exciting. Um, I agree. That's a very cool intersection. Yeah. yeah, and then metaphysical versus physical, and internal versus external. So there's a lot of kind of like common things there that we got really excited about that we're currently in the process of writing the script for. Okay. But we didn't want to wait until the movie was done to like get the idea out there. Um, and then also the, the, the cool thing is it happened to be that my name was Zorig, which her last name is Zorig and happened to be my dad's first name. Um, and Zorig means courage. And, uh, apparently, apparently the, the Latin root for courage is core, which is to, um, act and speak from the heart. So at the center of all of this is actually the word heart, right? Um, because heart is also the the thing that physically powers people as well. So it's 
there's a lot of ideas here that we're trying to there's explore. There's layers to it, yeah. Yes, many layers. <laughs> anyway, so uh, just felt like it was an opportunity for me to, it, it felt meant to be, first of all, um, a wonderful opportunity to, you know, like a beautiful partnership with with my husband, but also a creative partner. Uh, and as well as an opportunity to work with Bill, who also happens to be now my spiritual guru and <laughs> um, our, one of our, you know, most trusted mentors. And we work with, you know, closely on this, um, uh, on both the movie idea as well as the brand idea. So anyway, and there's more to it as well. You know, I never really considered the media industry uh, to go into, but the more I learned about business in general, every business is a media business and every tech business also starts with the brand as well, right? Like Apple. Hey, that's my example. line of work. I have yeah. a digital marketing agency. That's right. You're selling my services. That's yes. right, Kat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> every company is a media company. Every company sure. does need to think about their branding. 100%. Uh, and unfortunately, if you like talk to tech People, they they don't really appreciate the value of brand. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we need specs, sheets, and numbers. Yes. All they want to see is the data. Yes. They'll figure it out. They're smart people. Yes, exactly. Anyway, so there's every... no emotional story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> it's just facts. I feel you. You know what? On a spreadsheet, totally feel you. preferably on a. Excel spreadsheet. That's enough. That tells you all you need to know. Okay, yes. so real quick, before you come out here, because you're going to go from Boston to LA, your next move is coming to my neighborhood, I think. You're going to be out I here pitching so. something. Do you think, uh, yeah. which would be awesome, um, do you think, so there have been a number of tech advancements, and this is what I want to get into, because tech motivates art, art motivates tech. Um, mm -hmm. Some, you know, you could write a traditional screenplay, but, play, but it sounds like that's not what you're doing. It sounds like you're really infusing these concepts with the tech. Uh, yes. Notable examples in recent memory, The Mandalorian, that almost 360 degree. Are you familiar with how The Mandalorian was filmed? Yes. Speaking of green. Yes. Yeah. So the 360 degree screen. But it was still screen, very expensive as a green screen. Type. Millions yeah. of dollars to create yeah. a room like that. Yeah. A state of the art. There are a number of. But also, uh, I also follow groups talking of Blender. I follow this artist. I can't remember his name, which is really bad. I should be giving a shout out right now. Uh, <laughs> but the Blender community is wild the stuff that people are doing with blender is out of this world and they're creating entire yeah. sci-fi uh, futuristic landscapes that look as good as blade run i mean just all fabricated in a couple actors in front of a green screen like you mm -hmm. mentioned and the result is is phenomenal i wish i understood it more but it's very clear that we're on the precipice of all of the rules of filmmaking potentially going out the window Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> and you're going to lead and, that way. And the cool thing yeah. is, I, I hope so. I think the cool thing is um, us kind of like exploring uh, this broader idea of the movie, but with a kind of like snippets, right? Like we're just doing these like short films in a way um, before the feature is ready. <laughs> to kind of like help us explore the idea itself, right? Which has been fascinating. And I think that alone has been helping them build the tech as well. So it's kind of like this symbiotic relationship between Lightcraft Tech and us to uh, to get this out there, yeah. All right, so to bring it all full circle, we're talking about exploring ways to be the change that you wish to see in the world or to bring about that change. Uh, clearly, you have changed your own thoughts as we all do, as to what the best way is. Because if you have the goal of saying, I want to make an impact, then the next question is how? And what is the mm -hmm. what am I uniquely suited to? What opportunities do I have? It's a question that I ask myself all the time. What is the most effective way? Which mm -hmm. vehicle? And I think clearly you and I came to the same conclusion at some point, which is that companies are an effective way because you say, okay, getting groups of people together, putting capital, finding that that is an effective way of bringing about some kind of change. And also the other type of change, which is just making sure that smart, talented people have meaningful work. If you hire people, that's something that I like to do with my people. Like, I enjoy the feeling of providing work for the people that work for me. That was something I didn't know before I became a business owner, but mm -hmm. that has value too in saying, you're smart, you're talented, you should have money, you should do that, because otherwise your talents go to waste or who knows what happens, right? So now you're thinking that maybe art is something, and, and this is where 
sag after again, the striking people, there's always been an argument for art as being profoundly valuable to our society mm -hmm. um, and being at the forefront of a lot of these issues. So do you see, based on what you said about AI, of art and our own spiritual awakening, helping AI become better in the future or winning that battle, what do you think of as the role of art in the future and building a better future? Yeah, I mean, it's at the center of it, right? Um, one of the reasons why I did want to kind of like explore this side of the world is, um, I don't know if you've read a book called Sovereign Individual. Um, it predicted, it was written, I believe, in the 80s by these two guys, but they predict a lot of the um, a lot of the current technologies. Um, and one of the predictions that they had was that future of work is play, which is literally happening right now as AI continues to kind of automate the repetitive tasks. I think we have more time left on our minds and, you know, bodies to then explore more creative stuff and more higher level thinking and our intuitive self and all of that stuff. And that that right there is creativity, you know, to explore creativity means to, to become creative, uh, to innovate on ideas means to, um, to play, to, uh, you know, explore your, your inner, inner world and become more aware and present and connect the dots in your mind. Um, and all of that solves, it's, it's like a solution for mental health. In a way, yeah. right? It it really it, it, when you're playing and when you're when you're aware and when you're um, uh, creative and and creating things, not consuming things, which is kind of what's happening now. Um, I think we just kind of like self heal. Uh, so it is a solution for mental health. And and I I'm trying to remember the question: <laughs> what where is art? What's the importance in, in of the art? Why of the is it future? important? Yeah, because if you don't this, then like being creative, then means you're kind of like thinking about you're innovating, you're thinking about new ideas, you know, that that really kind of is aligned with who we want to be and who we are um, and who we are, are wonderful people. Like we're all just wonderful. Human beings are wonderful. Right. Um, and we just want love. <laughs> That's all we want at the heart of it. And um I, I feel like with art, you get to see that side of yourself. And therefore, when you're in a loving space, then you're able to actually innovate. Does that make sense? And that's yes. how it's how kind of society changes and moves forward. Right. It's hard to innovate in fear. Exactly. When you're when you're in fear. Oh, my God. It's, it's really scary. Yeah. It's really scary. Um, you're not innovating. You're just. Yeah. You're just, um, you're running away, you know? So you're, you're just focused on the problems. Um, you're, you're not able to come up with the solution. I, I don't know how else I, I, I would say it. But. Well, it's, it's certainly one of the great paradoxes of our time. And it's certainly something that I agree with because I don't spend any time consuming on TikTok, for example. But I'm aware that the younger generation spend all of their time consuming on TikTok. So I also agree with this statement and I've lived my life according to create more than you consume. I consume very little, but I create a lot. I do stuff like this. Uh, that's the ratio I've always felt. Mm -hmm. But of course, the great paradox or irony is that when you create a piece of art, you want all of the people to watch your film, right? <laughs> and so you're like, mm -hmm. everybody look at my piece of art. And it's it, that's just one of those things that we have to figure out because everybody is creating and consuming and mm -hmm. consuming is a way for us to escape our problems because when my life is stressful, when I feel anxiety, when I feel bad about the world, what would I rather do than hunker down, play a video game, not mm -hmm. answer the phone, not answer an email, and just completely tune out all of those obligations that I know are waiting for me? And there are many different ways that we try to deal with that anxiety that we feel, mm -hmm. and uh, some of them are clearly healthier than others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's also something about when you're in like a fearful state. Um, I don't know if you've going back to that energy power 
conversation uh, that we were talking about. When you're in that state, you're kind of like almost like sucking in. Yeah, yeah it's like you're kind of like sucking in energy versus when you're when you're in a creative, you know, um, playful mode. You're actually like generating energy, and you're, <laughs> you know, and and that. Um, that has so much power. Um, sorry, I just had to, I had to say that because that's something that, uh, that we're that's exploring good. for the, for the that's idea cool. of the movie. Um, yeah. Well, I'm excited <laughs> to see it. I, yeah. I can't wait to follow your progress. Uh, all right. So I always like to ask this question next five years, if everything goes brilliantly, what is the best possible outcome for you, for the world? What would you love to see happen in the next five years? Next five years. Aside from I would, to Southern California. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll be complaining like, oh, Boston was nice. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, for the world, um, I, I hope to see more people feel the courage slash Zorig to tell their stories, to fully embody their true selves, which is sorry, it's going to be weird. You are like, we're all weird and quirky and you know what I mean? Um, so fully embody that and, and, and express that without fear. Um, don't worry about all the, you know, oh, I have to, uh, just, um, there's going to be a lot of, you know, like rules and things like that, that you're going to have to, people are going to have to kind of like shed to be able to do that, uh, the rules that come from society or internal, you know, culture or internal um, messages, whatever it might be. Um, but I think people can heal from all of that to really have the courage to be themselves and express express themselves in a way that is that also leads to abundance, that also leads to wealth and freedom, um, and are in alignment with um, with just who they are <laughs> yeah it's a wonderful sentiment i agree with it completely may we all experience that and of course as we hear these stories that is the great joy and i hope more and more people but it will it's inevitable like i said as the minority changes to the majority the power and depth and richness of these stories that's where the meat is that's where the meat on that bone is and that's why mm -hmm. we're going to hear more stories from mongolia from other countries from other cultures because there's more interesting stuff that's happening there. And I agree that humanity is awesome. And my view of humanity being awesome is not limited to the people in my state or in my political party or my country. <laughs> I think people can be awesome anywhere on earth. <laughs> so I guess that makes me some kind of a freak, I suppose. But uh, what? that's what I believe. I mean, that's, no, that's what joking. I'm saying right there, right there. <laughs> no, I'm, jo I'm joking. I mean, you know where I stand. <laughs> I've been yeah. on the record for like 178 times at this point. Uh, I think this is the magic, and that's why I love these stories. And it's been an absolute pleasure learning about your story because it's so cool and watching you play and explore and go through these things and achieve and uh, figure out what that next step is is ultra, ultra cool. Just keep me posted. I want to see whatever <laughs> piece, whatever you make. I know it's going to be cool, so I got to see it. Um, yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah. And obviously just and to people, you know, like check too. out our, follow us. Yeah, we yeah. we decided not to kind of wait on the clothing either. We just want to launch and make the clothing available with the mini series of kind of movies in a way um, that, that'll that all culminate into the feature soon, hopefully. <laughs> um, but yeah, the clothing, the cool thing is, you know, Mongolian, awesome. these are called frog style buttons, but they're kind of like futuristic. Okay. And the reason why also, I love this, yeah. um, I, I decided that the brand could be something is because I wore this around and oh my God, the compliments I get on these. Of course. Cause it's they're just like, what is that? It's so cool. Oh, like everywhere. Anyway, <laughs> and, and and even you know talking about the kids, the kids love clothing drops. That's I mean Gen Z or younger, they yeah. love that kind of stuff. It's super cool. I mean even McDonald's did a campaign with some kind of futuristic clothing, and then that yeah. made McDonald's cool again. So I think you're on the right track, and I think when people see that, you know, look to TikTok perhaps because uh, the clothing is cool, and people are going to definitely want a piece of that, especially if it's limited edition or whatever. Which yeah. <laughs> 
Um, but as we reach the end of our time, yeah, again, where can people follow you? Check it out. You already gave some, but, uh, how can people get in touch or, or support or what, what's the best means of following along with you and your work? Yeah. Um, so our Instagram and all the handles are got Zorig. So G O T Zorig Z O R I G. Um, so that basically means we already have courage within us. We got it. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and also got Zorig.com is our site. So you can go there and, uh, you know, as we slowly drop these video or uh, our films, as well as these clothes, you know, you'll, Hopefully, uh, follow us along and order some of our clothes and and follow our journey. It's going to be incredible. Well, I knew this was going to be a fun episode, and you did not disappoint at all. It's been spectacular. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed your time as well. I Thank loved you. it. Thank you so Let's much, Russ. Both get our air conditioners back on. <laughs> but of course, like now it's like September. It's going to be freezing by the time this aired. But <laughs> <laughs> when was it taped? Also, yeah. September eighth. Uh, <clears throat> We got the magic of cinema, the magic of cinema. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And with that, the official podcast is over. It's over.